Hey Trinity Baptist family, this is Pastor Matt Crawford. Welcome back to our Wednesday evening Bible study uh, as we're going through 1st and 2nd Samuel. Uh, this is week 13. We're going to be looking at 1st Samuel chapter 20. So pray with me please as we begin. Father, thank you for your word and for the chance to look at it tonight. Lord, I ask that you would speak to us, uh, that you would uh, grow us in our faith and make us more like Jesus. Fill us with your spirit and bless us now. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Samuel chapter 20, as we look at one of my favorite uh, relationships, favorite friendships in the Bible, uh, a key moment, a moment of crisis in this friendship uh, between Jonathan and David. And, you know, we, we know that often in moments of crisis, people's character comes out and, and is revealed more than in, in any other type of situation. And that's definitely the case here with Jonathan and David as the, the depth of their relationship and their love for one another, their selflessness uh, is shown in this text. So let's pick up uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 20. It says, David fled from Nioth and Ramah, I remember he was there with, Sam, uh, with Samuel, and came to Jonathan and asked, what have I done? What did I do wrong? How have I sinned against your father so that, <coughs> excuse me, I knew that was coming for a while. <laughs> How have I sinned against your father so that he wants to take my life? And speaking of Saul here, Saul's been trying to kill David. Uh, he has, remember the Holy Spirit has left Saul, has gone to David. Uh, my assumption, especially as we, some, by something that Saul says in this text, my assumption is that Saul knows that David has been anointed by Samuel as king, or at least suspects it. Uh, and so Saul has been trying to kill him, and we'll see him do it that quite a bit more in this book before David becomes king. But it's unjust. That's what David's pointing out here. How have I sinned against your father? David has served Saul faithfully. He's fought. He's risked his life. Saul's actually his own father-in-law, um, and uh, he's you know defeated Goliath, all these sort of things by God's power and help. And so he is rightly um, upset, angry. Uh, he's righteously angry here uh, because Saul is acting not only unjustly, but murderously uh, without cause. Uh, verse 2, Jonathan said to him, no, you won't die. He's trying to reassure him here. Listen, excuse me, my father doesn't do anything great or small without telling me. He's like, my, my dad brings me into all of the counsels of, of what he's doing, so I wouldn't know if he was trying to do that. So why would he hide this matter from me? This can't be true. But David said, your father certainly knows that I have found favor with you. He has said, Jonathan must not know of this, or else he will be grieved. So David's saying, yeah, he talks to you about everything else, uh, but he knows that we're very close. So surely he wouldn't tell you if he was trying to kill me. Uh, David also swore, he, so he makes an oath here, as surely as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, there is but a step between me and death. So he's saying, look, this is how serious this is, Jonathan. I'm swearing, I promise you that your dad is, is, has it in for me uh, and that I'm barely alive as it is. Verse 4, Jonathan said to David, whatever you say, I will do for you. So Jonathan kindly, graciously quits uh, disputing this and says, look, what can I do to help? How can I help you? How can I support you? So verse 5, so David told him, look, tomorrow is the new moon. They have, would often have festivals and feasts uh, attached with certain parts of the year, including new moons. And I'm supposed to sit down and eat with the king. So he's invited to the king's table. That's not an invitation you take lightly. Uh, that's not something that you um, casually blow off. However, he knows that Saul's trying to kill him, so uh, he doesn't want to be there. And Saul has multiple times, I believe three times total, already thrown a spear at David to kill him in, in the palace. Instead, let me go, in, in other words, not go to the festival, go somewhere else, and I'll hide in the countryside for the next two nights. If your father misses me at all, say, David urgently requested my permission to go quickly to his hometown, Bethlehem, for an annual sacrifice there involving the whole clan. Uh, you might look at this. Uh, you might say that this is a lie, that David didn't ask that. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, perhaps he did go home during this time as he was, you know, traveling, going to the countryside. Um, or perhaps he, you know, in a sense was asking Jonathan that. Um, he's setting this up to try to find out Saul's actual intentions. That's the purpose of this. Verse 7, if he says, good, in other words, Okay, that's fine that he's gone back with his family. Uh, then your servant is safe. But if he becomes angry, you will know he has evil intentions. So if he's mad that David's not there, if he's not understanding uh, for this supposed time with his family, uh, then you know he, he wanted me there so he could kill me. Deal kindly with your servant, speaking to Jonathan, for you have brought me into a covenant with you before the Lord. So he references the relationship that they have and specifically the covenant, the solemn promise that they've made to each other 
uh, to be for each other, to support one another um, as, as friends. And they've made this as a covenant before God. Uh, if, if I've done anything wrong, then kill me yourself. Why take me to your fathers? He said, you know, you're a prince of the land. You're an authority. If I'm a criminal, deal with me now. If there's something that should be dealt with, if, I, if my life is forfeit by my actions, then take it now. Um, and of course, you know, he's, there's, there's nothing that he's done to deserve that. No, verse 9, uh, Jonathan responded, If I ever find out my father has evil intentions against you, wouldn't I tell you about it? He's promising, I'm going to let you know. Uh, I'm, even if my dad, you know, tries to stop me from telling you, I'm going to tell you what he's doing to protect your life as part of keeping their covenant before the Lord. So David asked Jonathan, who will tell me if your father's answers you harshly? harshly? So they're working out a communication plan here uh, to share the, the information that Jonathan gathers. He answered David, come on, let's go out to the countryside. So both of them went out to the countryside, possibly so they could speak um, alone and, and not have anyone overhear them. By the Lord, the God of Israel, I will sound, he's, again, he's swearing an oath there that I promise you I'm going to do this. I will sound out my father by this time tomorrow or the next day. If I find out that he is favorable toward you, will I not send for you and tell you? He's like, you know, he wants, he wants David to be reunited with Saul and, and to be able to openly be there with Jonathan as he had tried before, although at that time Saul tried to kill David in the, in the palace with a spear. Verse 13, if my father intends to bring evil on you, may God punish Jonathan and do so severely if I do not tell you and send you away so you may leave safely. Here's another oath. He's placing an oath on himself that if I don't follow through on my promise to you, may God, and it's a curse down on himself, that God punish me and do so severely if I don't follow through on this. Um, may the Lord be with you. This is powerful. May the Lord be with you just as he was with my father. Seems to be an acknowledgement from Jonathan. I know that the Lord used to be with my father, and may he be with you now, which we, we know is actually already happening. It's a blessing that J Jonathan speaks over David, uh, but it conforms to a reality that God has already made true. Verse 14, if I continue to live, this is big, this is important within the book, uh, within First and Second Samuel. If I continue to live, show me kindness from the Lord. God is giving you kindness. He, we, I believe he's going to make you king. Uh, and extend that kindness to me. But if I die, don't ever withdraw your kindness from my household. Not just me, uh, but, but those who are descended from me, those, uh, you know, my wife and, and children and their children. Not even when the Lord cuts off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. So even at the point where God blesses you, David, and, and, and all your enemies are gone, and you don't need help from anyone else, still show my family kindness. Uh, because of the relationship that we have, may this covenant between us extend to our descendants. Um, and I don't know if Jonathan had an inkling here of what would happen to him. A little spoiler alert, but at the end of this book, 1 Samuel, Jonathan does sadly die in battle um, along with Saul. And that's when David uh, becomes king over Judah and then a few years later king over a united Israel. Um, so God's uh, anointing over David does come does come to pass uh, when he becomes king. But I don't know if Jonathan had an inkling here. It's definitely sort of prophetic, whether he means it or not, that he would die. It's also prophetic for how David would um, honor this commitment, honor this, this charge that Jonathan gives him. Uh, and we'll come to that story when we get there, but it points ahead to a man named Mephibosheth um, that, uh, that, th that David would seek out and show kindness to as part of keeping this oath. Uh, that's important, the seriousness with which both of them take their commitment to the Lord and to one another, their commitments to one another before the Lord. Uh, that when they make these vows, they mean them and they follow through, and that's a good model for us. Verse 16, then Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, may the Lord hold David's enemies accountable. Uh, and I, and I, I, my understanding of that oath is that he's saying, if David doesn't follow through on this, May God require it by the hand of David's enemies. May God use David's own enemies to punish him for not keeping this oath. That's how seriously they both take this. Jonathan once again swore to David in his love for him because he loved him as he loved himself. Again, the second great commandment there. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Jonathan actually did it. Uh, and I think their, their model of selflessness here is so, so great for us. Uh, in that they, they just, they love one another, they love themselves, they care for one another. And Jonathan in particular acts in a sacrificial way. 
excuse me, putting, putting David first, acting in a way that, that doesn't fit <laughs> uh, with many kings and princes, that what we're used to seeing, how we're used to seeing them act, uh, where he would, you know, want the throne only for himself and would see David as a huge rival and, and possibly, in many cases, he would be just like Saul, wanting to kill David, but Jonathan's the opposite of that. Verse 18, then Jonathan said to him, tomorrow is the new moon. You'll be missed because your seat will be empty. The following day, hurry down and go to the place where you hid on the day this incident began and stay beside the rock Ezel. He's talking about a particular rock formation that David would have known as they plan how they're going to communicate after Jonathan talks to his father. I will shoot three arrows beside it as if I'm aiming at a target. Then I will send a servant and say, go and find the arrows. Now, if I expressly say to the servant, look, the arrows are on this side of you, get them. Then come, because as the Lord lives, it is safe for you and there is no problem. So if the arrow is near me, you know, you can come near as well. Uh, but if I say this to the youth, look, the arrows are beyond you, then go, for the Lord is sending you away. God, in this circumstance, is sending you away for your safety. As for the matter you and I have spoken about, the Lord will be a witness between you and me forever. He's calling God as a witness to their covenant uh, with one another. So David hid in the countryside. At the new moon, the king sat down to eat the meal, speaking of Saul. He sat at his usual place on the seat by the wall. Jonathan sat facing him, and Abner took his place beside Saul. Abner was his general, the leader of his army. But David's place was empty. Saul did not say anything that day because he thought, something unexpected has happened. He must be ceremonially unclean. Yes, that's it. He's unclean. So there were certain times, if you read the Jewish law, certain uh, situations where uh, they were ceremonially unclean and they would have to wait to participate in religious uh, practical practices and rituals. Um, like, for example, if they came in contact with a dead body. You know, David being a warrior, that happened a lot. Um, uh, or certain bodily functions, they would have to, they would be considered ceremonially unclean for a period of time. And they would have to you know, take a bath and wait a certain period of time before they were considered clean again. So Saul assumes, well, something like that has happened. So David is not uh, ritually allowed to be at the festival. He, he kind of chalks it up to something unexpected. He doesn't bring it up. But the next day, David's gone again, and he does bring it up. Verse 27. However, the day after the new moon, the second day, David's place was still empty. And Saul asked his son Jonathan, why didn't Jesse's son come to the meal either yesterday or today? Remember, it's a big deal to blow off a king's invitation to dinner. Jonathan answered, David asked for my permission to go to Bethlehem. He said, please let me go because our clan is holding a sacrifice in the town and my brother has told me to be there. So the claim is, and again, I don't know 100% that it's false. Uh, so I, I'm not going to call this a lie. Uh, but um, David says that his brother, uh, Jonathan's saying that David is saying that his brother has told him, hey, you need to be at this family event. So now, if I have found favor with you, let me go so I can see my brothers. That's why he didn't come to the king's table. Then Saul became angry at Jonathan and shouted, You son of a perverse and rebellious woman. That is probably a gentle translation. Many of the older translations, uh, or at least one in particular of the older translations, has a word that I can't say here. Uh, there, And so it is a, a very, very strong uh, term that, that Saul calls Jonathan, insulting both Jonathan's mother and Jonathan himself. Don't I know that you were siding with Jesse's son to your own shame and to the disgrace of your mother? There's a, it seems like a lot of irony there that he insults Jonathan's mother and then, uh, and then says, why are you disgracing your mother? Uh, one of the translations, by the way, in verse 30, uh, calls him, it's a New Living Translation, call, says, you son of a whore. I mean, that's, that's the strength uh, of, of how bad he's uh, responding here in this moment. And so he says, you're, you're siding with Jesse's son, who's a rival to the throne. That's to your own shame, and it shames your mother. Every day, Jesse's son, verse 31, lives on earth. You and your kingship are not secure. So Saul says, we need to kill him so that he's not a threat to you having the throne. And, J and Jonathan's already let go of that. We saw him chapters ago uh, give uh, you know his military items, his sword, his belt, his tunic uh, to David. Now send for him and bring him to me. He must die. In other words, you know where he is. Bring him to me so we can kill him. So we can end this threat to the throne, to our dynasty. Jonathan answered his father back. Why is he to be killed? What has he done? Reminding the king uh, that being king doesn't mean you could just do whatever you want. You are not, even in, as a king, you are not a law unto yourself. The king is subject to the laws. And so he can't just murder people. 
if, John, if David had done something wrong, something worthy of death, then he could have done this. Uh, but Jonathan rightly says, this is unjust, what has he done? And Saul has no answer to that other than to try to kill his own son. Verse 33, then Saul threw his spear at Jonathan to kill him. Not just to scare him, uh, not just to injure him, he's trying to kill his own son. Again, we talked about the madness that Saul seems to manifest. Um, as uh, Again, he's, he's being afflicted by uh, this demonic spirit, uh, and he's acting just out of control. Uh, and he's the, the, on the son that he's talking about trying to preserve uh, his line to the or his path to the throne, he throws a spear at him to kill him. It makes no sense at all. So he, Jonathan, knew that his father was determined to kill David. He, if, he, if he's trying to kill me, I know he definitely wants to kill David. That's that's uh, good logic there. Verse thirty four. He got up from the table fiercely angry. I would be too, uh, if my dad had just thrown a spear at me and did not eat any food that second day of the new moon. So he, it turns into a fast for him rather than a feast. Uh, he's just so upset. For he was grieved because of his father's shameful behavior toward David. As king, he should act in a more noble way, a more just way, and he's not doing that. In the morning, Jonathan, by the way, is, again, once uh, off in a contrast to Saul in terms of how the king should rightly act. And he acts in a royal manner uh, in, in the best sense of that. Jonathan does. Verse 35. In the morning, Jonathan went out to the countryside for the appointed meeting with David. A young servant was with him. He said to the servant, run and find the arrows I'm shooting. As the servant ran, Jonathan shot an arrow beyond him. He came to the location of the arrow that Jonathan had shot, but Jonathan called to him and said, the arrow's beyond you, isn't it? So remember, this is the appointed sign that he's telling David, you need to go away. You need to get away from my father. He is trying to kill you. Then Jonathan called to him, hurry up and don't stop. And, and so I, seemingly, I think he's telling David, it's urgent. You really need to get going. Uh, my, you know, again, Saul had tried to kill Jonathan himself. Jonathan's servant picked up the arrow and returned to his master. He did not know anything. Only Jonathan and David knew the arrangement. Then Jonathan gave his equipment to the servant who was with him and said, go take it back to the city. When the servant had gone, David got up from the south side of the stone as well, fell face down to the ground and paid homage three times. Uh, Jonathan sends the servant away, I think, so they can have this moment, just the two of them talking and nothing get back, you know, to, um, to Saul about this interaction. Um, but David comes, he, he honors uh, Jonathan. He's not worshiping him. He's paying homage uh, to him as his prince and his friend. Um, and, uh, and he's humbling himself, which is a big deal. Remember, he knows he's going to be king. And Jonathan has acknowledged that, uh, I think, through his actions. And he'll say it explicitly um, even in a little bit. So later in the book. Um, and so it says, then he and Jonathan kissed each other. There's nothing homosexual about that. Um, some people try to read that into their relationship, and that is absolutely false <laughs> and a twisted and wicked way of viewing Scripture. Um, but it, but and it, again, remember, in many other cultures, you'll see, you know, people, even men, kiss each other on the cheek. That's a very normal thing. He and Jonathan kiss each other and wept with each other, though David wept more. He's just overcome with emotion here. Um, this is a heavy moment for their friendship. Jonathan then said to David, go in the assurance, he's encouraging him, he's sending him, go in the assurance the two of us pledged in the name of the Lord, in the name of Yahweh, when we said, Yahweh will be a witness. Remember, all, all caps, L-O-R-D, behind that is the Hebrew name for God, Yahweh. Yahweh will be, a, will be a witness between you and me and between my offspring and your offspring forever. So may God uh, hold us both to our oath to love one another, to love one another's descendants. And, and may he protect you. Go, go in the assurance of the Lord. Then David left and Jonathan went into the city. This is a tough moment for these friends. Um, they were hopeful, especially Jonathan, I think, was hopeful that Saul had turned from his murderous uh, attempts on David's life. Uh, but that is not the case. It's even worse than Jonathan had thought. David was right. Uh, earlier in the passage when he says, as surely as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, there is but a step between me and death. Um, however, <laughs> don't forget, God has protected David in all of that, and he'll continue to do so. He is the Lord's anointed, and God protects his anointed. Um, uh, four big takeaways from this text. 
Number one, again, the depth of friendship and selflessness that these men model for us, especially Jonathan, all that he's giving up in loving David and keeping his covenant before the Lord and to David. It reminds me of Proverbs 18, 24, and this, this friendship may be the best example of this uh, in, in all of Scripture, other than Jesus himself is our friend. Um, 18, 24, one with many friends may be harmed, but there is a friend who stays closer than a brother. There's a kind of friend out there that is like family and can even be closer than family. I've been blessed with friendships like that, uh, especially friendships with other pastors or, or folks I grew up with um, who have blessed me and who are like family. Uh, and it's one of the great blessings of my life. Um, and, and surpassed really only by, in, in terms of relationship by my relationship with my wife, which, you know, she's, that's the closest kind of relationship. And, and that's, uh, that's closer than your other family as well. You know, that's your highest priority relationally. Um, so the question for us is, are you that kind of friend? The friend that sticks closer than a brother, the friend that loves, uh, selflessly, unconditionally, uh, sacrificially. Are you giving in that way? Like Jesus, right? This is the way that Jesus has loved us. He loved us, Romans 5, 8 says, while we were still his enemies and demonstrated that love by dying for us. He's our ultimate example of this. Jonathan David and David show us another way of how it should be lived out. And closely related to that, number two, friendship is an essential part, as I've said in previous week, an essential previous weeks, an essential part of discipleship uh, and encouraging one another in faith. And we should be intentional about the times that we spend with others, helping them to grow in their faith, asking them questions of accountability and, and bringing up scripture and encouraging one another and praying together. Don't miss those opportunities. You know, friendships should be about fun things, common interests, sports, you know, music, whatever it is you like to do. Uh, but be intentional about your friendships to help others grow in their faith, to spur them on to love and good deeds, as the book of Hebrews says. Number three. Uh, take your commitments to others seriously. This goes from marriage uh, to family commitments to promises that you make to when you're at work and you say, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it by this date. Be a person of your word, uh, especially commitments to the Lord. Obviously, your vows before God, your promises to him, whether it's your, your marital vows or or other promises you've chosen to make to God. We, we didn't, we, scripture over and over tells us to not take those lightly, to not do those rashly. And we see in Scripture multiple examples of those who do make rash vows before God and how it does not end well. Uh, so don't make commitments to the Lord rashly. And when you do, keep them. Uh, make, keep your commitments to others. Follow through on what you say you will do. Be a person of your word uh, so that people trust you. And ultimately, more importantly, so that God is glorified through your character and how you, uh, how you uh, live before the world as a Christian. Last thing. Uh, notice the way that God used Jonathan in his plan of redemption. And what do I mean there? Well, throughout this book, in so many ways, David points us ahead to the son of David. The way that God uses him, raises him up as king, uses him to destroy uh, God's enemies, especially Goliath, I think is a, a symbol for us of, of Jesus' ultimate victory over our greatest enemy, or the greatest giant, uh, our, over, over sin and over Satan and death, all the results of sin. Uh, so David so much in the book points ahead uh, to the Lord Jesus as the Lord's anointed um, to the one through whom God is going to uh, establish the kingdom. Uh, and God uses Jonathan as part of that plan um, in the way that he protects and blesses and supports David. And so it, indirectly, uh, God blesses us as Christians through Jonathan uh, because of his commitment uh, to the one who would uh, launch the dynasty uh, upon whose throne Jesus would reign forever. The dynasty of David, the Davidic king, will reign, is reigning, and will reign forever. Jesus is the son of David, and, and he's won. He's victorious. And when we trust in him, we share in his victory. Let's pray together. Father, thank you uh, for 1 Samuel 20. Thank you for this beautiful friendship, this beautiful relationship between David and Jonathan. May we be those kinds of friends to one another. Uh, especially as believers supporting one another in the family of God. And may we be the kind of friends to unbelievers that make them uh, want to know what is different about us in our selflessness, our love, our sacrificial uh, attitude uh, towards others. Uh, may we show your faithful love uh, th that you've given us uh, through our own actions. Uh, bless us and uh, bring us back together soon and safely. And thank you for uh, your uh, salvation in Jesus. In his name, amen.
I appreciate you watching. Hope you have a great week and hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.